Devil May Cry is probably one of my favourite video game series of all time. And now, with the release of Baldur's Gate 3, and me actually having played the game, I have to say that this game is incredible. Baldur's Gate 3 is probably one of, if not my favourite game of all time now, just because of the sheer complexity, the story, the many different builds you can do. It is incredible. As a tabletop game kind of nerd, this game absolutely like just blew my mind when I first started playing it. And of course, my immediate thought on my third playthrough was to combine one of my favourite game series with one of my new favourite games. That being Devil May Cry and Baldur's Gate. So, I decided to go with a build that is based on Devil May Cry, not necessarily trying to 100% recreate a Devil May Cry character's abilities as such, but to get as close as possible, and I think the final build that I have here definitely encompasses that. As you can see, we have Dante on the main screen, and I've just realised there's been no audio this entire time for the game, but that's okay, we'll work with it. Uh, I don't want to redo that intro, but here we have a character I've made that obviously is meant to represent Dante. You know, you have the white hair, the kind of hairstyle, and kind of the red jacket here. So as far as looks goes, the character definitely kind of nails it. Um, but basically, here's exactly what I wanted to accomplish with this build. We're mainly going to be trying to copy Dante's abilities. So that means wielding a big greatsword type weapon, but also being able to use very stylish attacks, because obviously the whole thing about Devil May Cry is that there's a lot of style to it, a lot of panache, a lot of maneuverability, and being able to string together very long combos. So I want to try and replicate that in this character. So I'm going to outline the character goals for this build right from the get-go. So first thing we want is long combos. This will be achieved by using things like the haste spell and things like extra attack and using our bonus action to attack to be able to just get as many hits in a single turn as possible. The second thing we want to accomplish is being stylish, to so being able to use lots of different variations of attacks. Luckily, Baldur's Gate 3 allows for this by the use of these once per short rest alternate attacks, but we're also going to be going the extra step further, as you will see later. The third thing, as I said, is the fashion. A lot of Devil May Cry characters use things like leather jackets um, and like just general kind of over the top, not quite anime clothes, but you get the point. And so I've kind of tried to replicate that as best I can here, while also giving us armor that gives us benefits that are in line with Devil May Cry abilities. And now we're going to get into, into the specific things about, for example, Dante, who this character is mainly going to be based off of. There are four things that Dante, there's four different fighting styles that Dante uses that are to the specific to his character. That being Trickster, which allows a lot for a lot of maneuverability and the ability to teleport. A Swordmaster, which allows you to use various different sword combos. A Gunslinger, which allows for the use of ranged weapons and different, I guess, ammo types or shot types. Basically, you get an alternate gun attacks, which we will be covering. And lastly is Royal Guard, which was definitely the hardest to replicate, but I think I've got it. So we're going to be going for Dante's four styles and also the two other things that make Devil May Cry so popular and like make the combat so fun, that being taunts and a devil trigger transformation. Now, if you've already played Baldur's Gate 3 and are kind of familiar with D&D, you probably know where I'm going to go with this, but I will be providing some alternatives to certain things that may seem obvious in case, because let's, a slight spoiler warning, um, the way you would get the Devil Trigger transformation in this game involves being a very evil character, and obviously that doesn't really fit the mold of a Devil May Cry character, but I do think I have an alternate way of achieving Devil Trigger, while not being as cool, or just kind of achieving a transformation in general that gives you a power boost, so I think I've got it covered. But let's get into the actual build. Uh, I will get into the equipment we use in specific details at the end of the game. Uh, I'm pretty sure I already put in a spoiler warning, so um, I will be spoiling certain locations and items, but I will not be spoiling anything story related except for one specific example which I will leave a timestamp for. So, you're going to be starting as a paladin. This is very important because it's going to get you a few things. A, it's going to give you great sword proficiency which we need, proficiency with any type of armor, even though we're only going to be using light armor by the end of the game, medium and heavy armor in the early to mid game is still very important so I would use that. And it's going to later on get us Divine Smites, because spoilers, we're going to be taking a second level of Paladin. So, moving forward is choosing your Oath. Now, I originally did go with Oath of the Ancients in my playthrough of this, um, because, well, I thought that the healing would be really useful early on, because I played this on Tactician. 
which was very difficult in the early game, and I thought that might help. But um, it didn't really work out because I almost immediately broke my oath, and that ended up costing me a lot of money. Because you can't respec your character, and you will be respecting this character a bit as you go through the game. Um, so unless you pay like a huge sum of money to like reinstate your oath, so I would actually choose Oath of Vengeance because it's by far the hardest one to break accidentally. You can break it intentionally, but as long as you're playing like a good aligned character, it's very hard to break the Oath of Vengeance. And you also get like the Inquisitor's Might and such. So yeah, uh, looking at our stats. So this is obviously looking a bit weird. Um, as if you look over here on the right, these are the stats I currently have, because this is just a character respec screen. Um, well, no, actually, that's not the stats I have. I've just realized it automatically changed it. So let me set all these to zero, and I'll show you exactly what you want to do. In fact, if I just click clear. Oh. Larian, I found a new bug. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, so... Let me show you the kind of stats you want to use maybe at the start of the game, and then I'll also show you the stats we're going to respec by the time we reach Act 3. So, here is the first stat you want at max. This is not going to change. You want 17 strength. This is really, really important because once you get your strength to 17 through certain in-game events, which I'll talk about later, you can actually get your strength to 20 without having to use an ability score improvement, and that's about where we want it to sit. Um, but for the start of the game, you definitely want to have Charisma at 16, and just you don't need to touch that again. Then you're going to want to just pump your Constitution and Dexterity up. You kind of just want your standard Paladin affair. Nothing too crazy here. Leave Intelligence and Wisdom as 8. We won't be needing them. That's for the start of the game. By the time you're at the end of the game, your stats are going to look a bit more like this. And... Well, I'll explain why later, like I said, I don't want to do any spoilers for items that you get in the game until later, but this will make a lot of sense later. But basically you're going to have a dexterity of 10, a constitution of 10, just so you, have that, so you don't have a negative penalty to it. Because even when you wear items that increase your base stats in Baldur's Gate, if your starting stat is at 8, for example, you will still take a negative 1 penalty before the item's buff is applied. So you want to make sure that for your dexterity and constitution, you want to have them at 10. Intelligence and Wisdom are at 10, just because that means we're not going to be taking a negative penalty on those, and we are never, and here's a bit of a spoiler, you are never ever going to be taking an Ability Score Improvement with this build. You are only going to be getting two of those, and they're going to be both spent into feats. So, that's where our abilities lie. So, as a quick overview, Paladin to start, Oath of Vengeance, this will be your final stat spread. Obviously, you go back in the video to see. But like I said before, go back in the video to kind of look at the starter stat spread or just use your best judgment. Whatever works for you, because you'll be respecting later. Anyway, we will confirm this. Oh, as an aside, for this, pick whatever you want. I would personally make sure you have athletics and perception and possibly persuasion just to get you through a lot of those checks in the game. That's just my personal recommendation. Um, we have Medicine and Intimidation as our background, because when you play for Dark Urge, which is what I played for this character, you don't get to choose your background, so you're stuck with the Haunted one. Intimidation is not a bad skill to have, but Medicine is kind of air, so you do take a bit of a loss there. If you don't want to play a Dark Urge character, uh, just pick whatever background kind of fits your skill set the most. But yeah, we will confirm that and move on. Uh, you're going to see my bottom screen here is a bit all over the place, but we'll get to why in a minute. So let's go to the level up screen. But for level 2, you're not going to go anywhere particularly interesting, you're just going to go straight into Paladin. Now, uh, Paladin level 2, you get Divine Smite, which is absolutely huge and is going to be probably your main damage dealer for this build. Um, so, if you don't know what Sm Divine Smite is, it basically just means you get to spend a spell slot to just absolutely dunk on enemies with Radiant Damage. It's really, really powerful, and you will be making a lot of use out of it. You also get a fighting style. Now, this is entirely up to personal preference. I personally went with defense because since we're going to be wearing my armor, we want to get, we want to be able to stack as much armor class as possible. For reasons we'll get into later, especially on tactician. Uh, but you can choose to go for defense or great weapon fighting if you want a bit more offense. So you get to reroll ones or twos on damage die, which can be very, very powerful, especially if you're doing a lot of attacks in a round. So it's entirely up to personal preference. I personally like going with defense, but if you want to choose great weapon fighting, which is probably the power building move, I would go with that. Now the spells, this is going to be interesting. So 
as you play this build, maybe in the early game it'll be a bit different, but you are never ever going to use your spell slots for casting spells. In combat, at least. There are going to be some situations where you'll be able to do it outside of combat, but we're mostly going to be taking ritual spells, which you don't spend a spell slot in as long as you are not in combat. But there are a couple of utility spells that you're going to want to have on this build, which are just worth having anyway. And eventually you'll get to the point where you're going to have so many spell slots, it's not really going to matter. So pick whatever you like for this. Uh, I would personally take Command, because you can do some early game shenanigans with that. Compelled Duel kind of works a bit like a taunt from Devil May Cry, so it's nice thematically, like you kind of goad the enemy into attacking only you, so that's kind of fun. Uh, Bless is a very useful spell. Uh, Shield of Faith, if you're not concentrating on anything else, could be really good. And for your last spell, you can just take Cure Wounds, because you might as well just have a heal, but if you want to use like the kind of different smites, you can as well, but this is what I would personally go with. Right. At level 3, we are leaving Paladin, and we are never coming back. You only need two levels of Paladin to make this build work. So we are going to be multi-classing. Now the thing is, again, if you've probably if you played DD, you play Builders Gate, you probably know where this is going to be going. But again, we want to go in for that very charismatic fighter, that one that does a bunch of different things, has a lot of move for ability, has a lot of utility, has a lot of different tricks up their sleeve. So we're going Bard. Dante is 100 percent a bard in the terms of DD. Going Bard this early on is going to give us a lot of things, and it's also going to allow us to get to some abilities that we want really, really early on. First off, Cantrips. Vicious Mockery. There's your taunt. That's it. That is one of our goals encapsulated in a single Cantrip. Vicious Mockery is really, really fun in Baldur's Gate 3, because it, you act, there's actually like a ton of recorded like lines for taunts, and you actually... like. All the animations are just very full of like swagger and panache. It's literally perfect for this build. So we're going to take Vicious Mockery, and the next thing you're going to want to take is Friends. It literally just gives you advantage on pretty much every important role in the game that's related to dialogue. It is so broken. Yes, in Tactician, um, it's like, oh, you know, people will get mad at you because they know you charmed them. The amount of times where that actually came up was negligible. Party members, like, your relationship with them will just go down a little bit, but that easily comes back up just through playing the game. Um, and story events, where you're just talking to a character one-off, they almost never bring it up anyway. So just taking friends, even in tactician mode, is so broken. And the fact that you get it this early on, like, pretty much before the end of Act 1, or, heck, even before, like, you know, you go to the Goblin Camp for the first time, for example, early game, I guess, but, like, it's really powerful. You, you'd be nerfing yourself heavily not to take this. Now for the spells, this is where it gets a bit interesting. But as I said before, we're not going to be taking any spells that actually deal damage or are used in combat, so we want to save our spell slots for Divine Smites. So in, re in this case, we're going to be taking Ritual spells, of which we can get four right away. Long Strider is probably the most important here. Until your next long rest, you cast it right as soon as you wake up in the morning, and you get a plus three, you get three meters to your movement speed. That is insane, especially early on in the game. And that also helps with our maneuverability, which is something we were going to, you know, want to get anyway. So this really, really helps. It just gives you more maneuverability for absolutely free. And there's, you don't have to concentrate on it. It's always prepared and you never have to spend spell slot on it. It is broken. And when you get higher level spell slots, for example, like a level four spell slot, you can cast it on your whole party for free at the start of the day, so everyone gets this buff. If you're not using Longstrider and you have the option to, you are definitely missing out. Um, next one is going to be Speak of Animals. This is just because it's, again, a ritual spell that lasts all day, and it lets you talk with animals, which just gives you a ton of extra dialogue, extra roleplay, extra quests, extra cool things. Again, it's one of those spells that you just always want to have, because it's just fun, especially in the terms of this game. Uh, next is disguise, is disguise Self, another really powerful ritual spell, allowing you to disguise yourself and just, you know, gain, engage in much more roleplay, engage in much more dialogue options. It's just perfect. Obviously, it's not exactly very fitting for a Devil May Cry build, but since we're not using our spell slots for damage, there's no reason not to take this. And lastly, you're going to take Featherfall. Again, just an extremely powerful utility spell, casts full, cancels full damage, adds to your maneuverability, just makes everything way better. So, yep, yeah, we're not taking any damaging spells, no fairy fire, no healing word, we're just taking everything that gives us out of combat buffs that help us with our maneuverability. Are your starting instrument, 
As a bard can be whatever, I would personally choose a lute because Dante has actually canonically used a guitar as a weapon before, so, you know, but pick your favourite here, it doesn't really matter, you can get more later in the game anyway. And as for your ability, you get one free skill proficiency, choose whatever, I personally went with deception because that would give me all three pillars of conversation in one build, and again, a small spoiler here, we're not going to be taking certain abilities later in the game that would give us expertise in those, so, because... I don't know, I, this is more of a personal preference, but I just didn't go with the elephant powers in this run. Uh, level up. Now we're going to be staying with Bard for a little bit, because there's a few things we want to get. But, uh, right away, with level 2 Bard, you get some really, really powerful abilities. You get, you get Jack of All Trades, adding a proficiency bonus, or half of it, sorry, to any ability checks you are not proficient in. So by taking our stats the way we did, getting our wisdom, intelligence, all that up to so there's no negative penalty, that means we have a plus two to any skill roll in the game. Minimum. That is strong. We're also getting a couple of extra spell slots, including our first level two spell slots, because the way multi-casting works in D&D and Baldur's Gate is that when you mix spellcasters or a spellcaster and half spellcaster, you kind of level up your spell slots out either a bit sooner or just slightly delayed. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but basically you're still going to be getting a large amount of spell slots, even though you're not a full caster all the way. You also get Song of Rest, which, especially in Tactician mode, is extremely powerful. You get a third short rest per long rest, so you get three instead of two, which is insane. It is insanely good in this game, and it's absolutely worth having at the early levels. Uh, we're also going to gain a new spell. Uh, you can kind of take whatever you like here because it's not really consequential. I mean, Charm Person seems like an obvious choice, but you don't actually need it because, well, Friends works anyway. I think this is a ritual spell as well, but don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure it doesn't say it here. I'm not sure if it's like a better bonus than Friends, but you might as well just use Friends. I've never found a reason to use Charm Person, Charm Person even when I've had it on my character. Uh, so you can choose Fairy Fire, Dissonant Whispers, basically pick your favourite here, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to go with Fairy Fire, just because it's like, gain advantage on attacks, it's pretty good. You replace the spell, but we're not going to. Moving on. Next up is Bard level 3, and this is where we finally get our Bard subclass. We're coming into this really late, and unfortunately this build does take until the mid-game to kind of really kick off. But this is where, at level 5, you're going to be getting your Bard subclass. Uh, you can pick a spell, uh, you can pick a level 2 spell here. I would personally pick the Knock spell or the Invisibility spell. It's kind of up to you, I mean, you can pick whatever you like, but I prefer having either of these two for utility reasons. Or if you wanted another Ritual spell, you can have Detect Forts. So, but I feel like you don't need this one straight away since your Charisma skills are so high, but if you wanted some extra dialogue choices, you can go with Detect Forts. In fact, that, now that I think about it, I would probably go with this one first before these two. Because if you have someone who can pick locks, knock is not the best spell to have. It's kind of a waste. But I, so if I would, but since we're going to be picking up level two spell slots later, you would definitely want to have either detect forts, invisibility, or knock, and you're going to be getting those kind of in whatever order you please. So you're going to end up with all three eventually. But I admit you can start with detect forts. Now here is the most important thing: the subclass. And again, if you've played as one of these bards in Baldur's Gate three, you probably already know where I was going from this a mile away. But I didn't actually notice this until I, until I started fairy crafting for this build. The College of Swords is extremely different in this game compared to 5e for the most part. Because you get these. The weapon flourishes. This is huge. Well, these weapon flourishes... I cannot speak today. What these weapon flourishes do is they give you attacks that do an extra d6 of slashing damage but also have various effects both in melee and in ranged, so we're covering alternative gun attacks and alternative sword attacks in one subclass. This is huge. First up, Slashing Flourish. For both melee and ranged, you get to attack two enemies at once. So with Slashing Flourish in melee, you can attack two enemies that are right in front of you, pretty similar to the cleave attack. But in act, but in also, um, but sorry, if you go with the ranged version, you just get to shoot, uh, where is it? Yeah, you just get to shoot two enemies anywhere in your natural range. It is broken. You get an extra d6 of slashing damage on any ranged attack. It, but here's the kicker. For some reason with the slashing flourish ranged, you can target the same enemy twice. So you can just deal double damage on a crossbow shot, because spoiler alert, we're getting crossbows, in a single hit. 
That's insane. That's two massive damage buffs. If you're running one of those like dual crossbow builds that I've seen going around so much, uh, where you go like fight a rogue, I would honestly consider taking three levels of bar just for this and the other two flourishes that we'll get to in a minute. It's so, so good. All it costs is a use of your bardic inspiration, which you get back on a short rest, of which we have three of. So this alone, slashing flourish ranged, is one of the most powerful things you get out of this build, but we're not even done. Next we get Defensive Flourish, which if you land your hit, you get an armory, armor class increase of 4. That's almost as much as the shield spell, while you're still doing damage. It's insane. Uh, and again, all it costs is Bardic Inspiration. This covers one aspect of our kit that we're trying to go for, and that's Royal Guard. Because the only way to really get like the instantaneous blocks that Royal Guard get, gives you in the Devil May Cry games is to increase your armor class. So by doing this... We're covering Royal Guard and Swordmaster in one blow. It's insane, but you again, you also get this at ranged. So, <laughs> all it costs is your Bardic Inspiration, which again, is a really, really easy resource to maintain. And then lastly is the Mobile Flourish. And this is awesome. You get to knock an enemy away from you, either in melee or at range, dealing extra damage. And then afterwards, you can teleport to them. That's Trickster. Easily, that is Trickster, with nothing, like, no sacrifices made. You're just getting more power, but completing the kit. The College of Swords is my favorite bard college, bard subclass, whatever you want to call it, in this game. Not to mention that pushing attacks, like, obviously, I think a lot of people who play Baldur's Gate 3 know how powerful shoving is in this game. So being able to do that, basically for free, and at range, like, for example, having a Repelling Blast, Eldritch Blast, like, this one subclass covers so many facets of combat, it's insane. Not to mention, as a bit of a buff as well, we're going to be getting an extra fighting style. Now, you only have two to choose from. And we're going to be going with two weapon fighting, because like Dante, we're going to be dual wielding crossbows. And so having two weapon fighting allows us to have our offhand weapon, which is going to be our offhand crossbow, use our ability modifier, so it's going to give our crossbow fighting even more power. Insane. You can also replace a spell here, but we're not going to do that. Next. Oh yeah, you also get like, expertise to, per to perception and or persuasion and deception. So you just get expertise too. It's awesome. Right, we're going to continue in Bard. We get another cantrip here. Uh, this is kind of a pick your favorite situation if you want more defensive options. So if you want to kind of go into Royal Guard a bit more, uh, you can go for Blade Ward. There's also Mage Hand, which is just really good in general. Uh, since you're most likely going to be playing a human, if you want to go for the full um, kind of Dante look, uh, you might want to go with Light or Dancing Lights, because you won't have Dark Vision, but honestly, that doesn't really matter. My personal choice would be uh, Blade Ward or Mage Hand, or if you want to go into Dante's lesser known style Doppelganger from Devil May Cry 3, you could go for Minor Illusion. It's not really necessary. I would personally just take probably Blade Ward, just because of the extra defense you can get. Um, there's something else I was going to mention. Oh, well, I'm sure it'll come to me. Right, we get another level 2 spell here. Um, you can grab whole person or invisibility or whatever. I'm just going to take the invisibility spell for the utility. Or you could take C invisibility, that can also be really useful. Um... You know, it's entirely up to you. Uh, you can take whatever you like here, but I would personally take another utility spell. So, see invisibility, knock, or invisibility. But here we get our first feat. Now, at this point in the game, you're probably not going to be using your crossbows yet, because we haven't taken the subclass that's going to give us the most out of our, um, you know, our... Um, our crossbows yet, so you probably are going to want to go with a different feat. Again, you can respec, so if you want to take an ability score improvement to get any of your stats up, you can. But I'm just going to go with the first feat we're going to be taking, and that is... Da -da 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 -da, great Weapon Master. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with this. I know how good it is. Um, obviously taking a minus 5 to your chance to hit, to get a, pl to get a flat 10 damage on all of your melee attacks, is huge it is extremely powerful but with this build in particular you're not really going to be getting much out of that because it's going to lower your chance to hit and we're not really countering that enough 
so... Hmm. It's up to personal preference whether or not you have that specific feature on, because it's a toggleable passive. But you you can choose to have that if you want or not. I personally had it toggled off um, because I didn't get this ability until the late game. It was the second feat I chose, but I'm kind of changing it around for this video. So use it if you feel like you're going to be able to hit or if you really need to kind of do for, go for the risk reward. But the main thing we're here for actually is the Great Weapon Master bonus attack. When you land a critical hit or kill an enemy, you can use your bonus attack to make another attack. With the maneuverability that we have, you're going to be able to use this quite a lot. And again, it's another part of our long combo. So definitely want to take this as soon as you can. Next up, we have Bard 5. Now, that takes off even more from this point. You're going to get one of Inspiration. You regain all your Bard Bardic Inspiration after a long or short rest. Boom. Now you just get, basically you get to upkeep your flourishes pretty much after, in between each combat. So you just have a combat, you have a short rest, which most people will do, get all your flourishes back, you get to do it again. By the end of this build, you're going to have four points of Bardic Inspiration, so you're going to be able to do four of these flourishes per combat. Between mixing them in with your smites, um, you're going to be able to do a lot of damage and have a lot of flair and panache, because the fun thing about the flourishes as well is they each have different attack animations, so you get to be really stylish. Uh, you get some. You also get improved Bardic Inspiration, so if you want to use it outside of combat, you get to have a D8 instead of a D6. That's not going to come up much, but it does exist, so it's cool to have. Level 3 spell slots at this point, uh, which is a nice buff to our Divine Smites, and then we're going to go for a spell. So we now have access to level 3 spells, none of which I'm too particularly interested in. You could take Speak with Dead here, because um, it's another ritual out of combat thing that you can have, but I. I don't, this is kind of an irk I have with this game. 99% of the time when I try to use Speak With Dead, the game just says this corpse has nothing to say. And I just find that there's barely any actually any actual opportunities to use this, so I don't think it's really worth it. Personally, I would take Sea Invisibility or Knock. I would take Knock, just because it's a nice extra thing to have if you roll really bad on your luck picking rolls and you run out of Thieves tools, you can at least get that thing open regardless, a cost of a level 2 spell slot. And our journey in Bard ends with level 6, where we finally, finally, at level 8, get extra attack. Finalizing our combo string, allowing us to use an extra Divine Smite, an extra Flourish, an extra attack, whatever we want to do. So that's here now. We also get Counter Charm, which isn't the greatest in this game. There is a few situations where, in combat, you are going to be getting charmed a lot and frightened a lot. Uh, there's a few boss battles in particular that I can think of where this might actually be useful, but the fact that it takes an entire action, and if you use this, you don't get your extra attacks and such, it's not great, and the fact that it only lasts three turns kind of sucks. So you, if you want to use it effectively, you kind of have to preempt when your enemy is going to be trying to cast these um, charm or frighten spells at you. Uh, I would personally just forget it's there, but use it as you feel like you need to. Uh, we get our level 4 spell slot here, unfortunately the only one we're going to be getting, which kind of hampers this build a bit in, exam for, in comparison to a Paladin Sorcerer, for example, but with my experience um, in the, with this build playing on Tactician, I was able to beat pretty much all of the endgame bosses really, really easily um, with this build. Like, this build is strong even with a minimal amount of spell slots. It's, and I think this is still more than a Paladin would normally get if you just went all the way Paladin, but I can't remember that if they only go up to level 3 or not. I'm not personally an expert in that. Uh, we get another spell here. I would just take the Invisibility. Again, it's a nice utility that you get to have, um, especially against enemies where they can turn invisible, which is really, really annoying. So, yeah, I would take that here. Now, at level 9... Um, we are going to be doing another multi-class into our final class for this build. And again, if any of you are power builders in this game, you know exactly what I'm going for. We are going Rogue. So with Rogue, we get two skill uh, expertise, which is really, really awesome. Take whatever you want. Uh, we've already got expertise and persuasion, I think. Or perhaps not. I don't know. You can get in intimidation expertise. I would personally take sleight of hand and perhaps perception for being able to sense traps or maybe even athletics so you can shove people and like do a bunch of stuff even better but i would definitely make sure you have sleight of hand for picking locks which again can make knock kind of redundant but then you can just um 
change that spell, maybe, when you respec. But I'm going to go with Slant Hand of Perception for now. Next up is level 2, um, which is going to add to our maneuverability, because we're going to get bonus action, disengage, dash, and hide through the cunning actions. These kind of fall into the trickster line of just giving us way more maneuverability in combat. With this plus Long Strider, you get a ton of maneuverability. You will be able to run it across entire arenas and attack whoever you need to with your greatsword, even without having to use ranged attacks. This much maneuverability is extremely important. Well, I didn't, and also be, before I forget, while I didn't really touch on it, a level one we did get sneak attack. You are never going to be able to use sneak attack as a melee fighter because we're not going to be using a finesse weapon. But your crossbows, your dual crossbows that you'll be getting, will be using um, your your. You can use sneak attack ranged with that. It's never going to come up much, uh, but you can get a sneak attack with range with that. So that does still work. But yeah, we're going to take level 2 of Rogue. Nothing not so much to see here, just a lot more maneuverability. Rogue 3 is where this build finally kicks off into the stratosphere, because we are going to be getting the Thief subclass. Now, I don't know what kind of, like, crack um, Larian was smoking when they made the Thief subclass. But, you get, but if you know, you know. But you get, you get two bonus actions. Per turn. With the fast hands feet, gain an additional bonus action. Two bonus actions per turn. Whenever I make a melee fighter build in this game, or just a fighter kind of character in general, like a barbarian, for example, it is incredibly difficult not to take four, three or four levels of rogue to get this feature. Because, for example, if you're playing a frenzy barbarian, uh, or I think it's called the berserker, or whatever, your rage gets turned into frenzy, or it's just called the frenzy barbarian, where you can make bonus action attacks like that way and you can do bonus action throws you get to do that twice it's insane this plus our great weapon master feature and our dual crossbows we can do insane things so for example you can do um divine smite a second divine smite with your extra attack uh and then you can do two off-handed attacks with your crossbow or a crossbow attack and a great weapon master attack you can do a flourish if you decide to forgo one of your second fat smites. It is insane how much utility the second bonus action gives you. So let's say, I'm just going to do the math quickly in my head. Let's say you have haste. Uh, you, unfortunately, we don't get haste on this build on our own, which sucks. But you can get it, obviously, just have like maybe like a sorcerer in your party. I personally um, respect Gale into a sorcerer. And give him and get so he gets the ability to twin haste. So basically, get someone on your party to cast haste on you. You get one, two attacks from attack and extra attack, four attacks, so two more attacks from uh, the haste. So you get to do your action and your extra attack again. So that's four divine smites or flourishes, whatever have you. Then you get to make two crossbow attacks using your bonus action. That is six attacks in a turn. Now, you're probably thinking, why not just go Fighter for Action Surge here? I find that taking two levels of Fighter for Action Surge doesn't actually give you as much, because whereas ac Action Surge is once per short rest, you get this is constant. So I feel like in those scenarios where you're going to be going on for a long time, this is just more valuable. And, I mean, if I did originally test a version of this build where instead of taking the, um, the four levels of Rogue, you took four levels of Eldritch Knight Fighter in order to get more spell slots and, um, obviously, Action Surge and Second Win and that. But I found it to be less effective in practice than this particular build. Obviously, it's down to preference. If you want to go with an Eldritch Knight Fighter for more spell slots and more spells, such as, you know, Misty Step and Shield and such, which we do get anyway, but I'll explain later. Um... You can do that, but I would personally go with Fast Hands Rogue and just blitz them with ranged crossbow attacks, because you can do like a full crossbow flurry, and it's just more like in tune with Devil May Cry, I think. So yeah, we're taking the Thief subclass here. And finally, at level 12, we are a Rogue form, which means we get a Thief. And we are going to be finally taking, since now we have our full crossbow attack, we're going to be taking crossbow expert. 
because what this does is it allows you to not take disadvantage on your attack rolls in close combat with crossbows, which means that now you can work your crossbow shots all on one enemy even at close range. Because before what you would have been doing is you would have been doing attacks on a character that's in front of you and then trying to get crossbow shots off on maybe someone else in the same combat. Whereas now you can focus everything on one character and just do Nova damage. Uh, again, I was able to take on some really, really powerful bosses in the end game doing this. Uh, and obliterate them. It was insane. But yeah. Uh, that is it for the actual character build. The final stats are here. Uh, you get some hit points and you get your feet here. So now, spoiler warning, we're going to be going on to the items here. I'm going to try not to spoil story stuff, but you are going to be getting um, some important items that make this build work and kind of allow us to take those lower stats in order to gain more power. So... Let's move on to the equipment. So, so like I say, full spoiler warning here, I am going to be spoiling um, end game items and locations, but nothing story related. So if you're worried about that, um, you know, just end the video here. But here we go. Uh, into our inventory, we are going, here are the equipment we're going, here, here are the equipment? Here is the equipment. <laughs> you can tell I'm not reading off a script here. Um, so first off, let's go with the armor. We are wearing the elegant studded leather. You get this by completing the quest for the counting house, in which you have to get back some stolen gold. Um, in which case you get a key that unlocks a vault that allows you to get this. Uh, it is, it's essentially a studded lover plus two with a few extra features. Uh, you get uh, plus two to initiative rolls, a base 14 armor class, advantage on stealth checks, you also get shield, which once per short rest, which again, you have three of, you get to increase your armor class by five. As a reaction, um, one of the most powerful level one spells in the game, one of the most powerful reaction choices in the game, it is really, really good. Yes, we only get it once per short rest, which sucks, but this also gives an extra oomph to our royal guard. Because if you stack this with the defensive flourish, you can't get hit. It just nothing can hit you. It's... It's absolutely crazy. So definitely, definitely, definitely want to pick this up. Also, you can uh, re-dye it to look this kind of reddish brown color. This is as close as you can get to like an actual like Dante look I found. I know it looks a bit more brown than red, but it's the closest you can get. Um, I forget which dye this is. It's either the lush burgundy or the muddy red. So do some experimentation and figure out which one it is. Uh, next up, one of the most important items you can get, the Gloves of Dexterity, sets the wearer's dexterity score to 18, and also gives you an attack plus one. This is insane! This is an extremely powerful item that you can get as early as the start of Act 2 from a vendor in the Githyanki crash before the cursed lands. Absolutely want to get your hands on this as early as you can in the game, uh, because... Again, once you have that 10 set in dexterity and wear these, you never have to level your dexterity again. And the extra attack plus one on top is just chef's kiss. It's beautiful. Exactly what you want. Uh, and also, it fits perfectly with the outfit fashion-wise. Like, it just, it's perfect. And uh, next up is the Disintegrating Night Walkers. You get these in Act 2 in the Underdark by completing the quest to save uh, the person who's trapped in a cave-in. Now, the reason I decided to go with these is they are kind of like a black boot type thing, they're lightweight, so they kind of resemble Dante's boots a bit. But the thing is, is what's important about these is uh, you cannot be in webbed, entangled, or ensnared, and you cannot slip on grease of ice, or grease or ice. So you get total maneuverability. But the big ticket item here is the once per short rest Misty Snap, a full unrestricted teleport that you get to use as a bonus action at any point. Again, only one per short rest, which sucks, similar to shield, but having one use of it is better than not having any use of it at all especially when we have other options for maneuverability and teleporting as well and again it's another teleport more trickster abilities really 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 strong set of boots here uh the next thing we have is our amulet which is the amulet of greater health it sets your constitution score to 23 again not needing to level constitution in that case you also get advantage on constitution saving throws this is insanely overpowered. As you can see on tactician mode, where you get a little bit less HP per level, I am sitting at a comfortable 138 HP. 
insane really really good um absolutely the best thing you can wear here uh you'll notice i'm not wearing a cloak actually as i'll go on about it just it's purely for fashion reasons but if you want to wear a cloak i would just wear the cloak of protection or something or whatever your personal preference is because that just gives because the cloak of protection is really easy to get in act two at the inn and it gives you a plus one to saving throws and armor class so you know take your poison there uh, but you can use whatever you feel like is appropriate if you don't feel like going with, if you don't care about fashion. Um, next up, we have the Ring of Regeneration. This is extremely strong. It recovers 1d4 of hit points at the start of each round. Even if, but here's the reason why it's important. So yes, you get a little bit of healing of each round. But if you go down in combat, right? Uh, and you don't fail your death saving press immediately, you actually get back up on your next turn without anyone having to intervene. And since you still get your two bonus actions on that turn after you get up, because you don't get an action if you, on the same turn you, you get up from being downed, you still get to fire off two crossbow shots. Like, you still get to have a bit of, and a bit more maneuverability. So, for example, you could get up and use Misty Step to get out of danger. So it's very, very much worth having. I mean, if you can think of another ring that would fit better here, go ahead. But it also works in tandem with our helm, the helm of Baldurin. Uh, you get this by finishing Baldurin's Hero Trial underneath the underneath the City of Baldur's Gate in Act 3. It stacks with the uh, effect of the ring, giving you a plus, giving you a two-point heal at the start of each turn, which is strong when combined with the ring, so you can get anywhere from three to six hit, point, hit points per round, um, which kind of works in the Devil May Cry thing, because, you know, Dante and all the others, they have insane, like, healing factors, so just having that little bit of healing is quite nice. You have a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws. Again, really powerful, especially when we're wearing light armor, so we need as much armor class as we can get. Your means being stunned, brilliant. Completely takes away another aspect that would stop our combos. And attackers cannot land critical hits. Absolutely broken. All that in a single helm slot. Yes, it takes quite a lot to get it, but if you know where to go at the start of Act 3, you can actually get this without fighting anything, so it's really important to just grab this as early as you can. Lastly, this is a bit of a weird thing. So this is the ring of free action. Now, I wasn't sure what ring to put in the second slot here because none of them really appealed to me. Originally, I had Crush's ring to give an extra three movement speed to just give even more maneuverability, but I found it to be a bit overkill. Uh, you can also try the Risky ring to give you advantage on saving, to give it you advantage on attack rolls, which is really strong at the cost of disadvantage on saving throws, which can be a bit eh, but I don't know, play around with the second ring slot if you want kind of a guaranteed all-around safe bet. I mean, I'm using the ring of free action, which just ignores difficult terrain and you can't be paralyzed or restrained. So in combination with, you know, the Helm of Baldurin preventing stuns and this preventing um, surface issues, you basically cannot be stopped by any sort of terrain or effect that would keep you immobile. I think the only one that still affects you is Frightened, so... Keep an eye out for that. Um, but another ring you could use here is the Ring of Protection, which just gives you a plus one armor class and saving throws. If you really just don't know what to put in that slot, and you just want a flat buff. Um, but yeah, play around with the second ring slot, but I personally found that the Ring of Free Action just gives you a lot of maneuverability. Now, on to the weapons, which is probably the most important part of this build as far as actually making Dante. So obviously we wanted to use a great sword. So, I went with the best possible choice, the Baldurin's Giant Slayer. Giants, it has the Giant Slayer ability, which on a hit, doubles the damage from your Strength modifier. Well, we have our Strength at 20, so that takes a plus 5, and makes it into a plus 10. Insane. You actually get a plus 13 overall here, if you look at the stats. But it does 15 to 25 damage, so pretty good. It's a plus 3 enchantment. And, but here's the thing. Now, this is where I want to talk about Devil Trigger. So, obviously the most close thing you can get to Devil Trigger is, and I will put a spoiler warning here, skip to the time pump on the screen if you don't want to hear this big story spoiler, but if you're playing the Dark Urge character and you go into the Temple of Ball, or you kill certain NPCs throughout the game, you will get access to the Slayer form, which, as if you know if you played this game, is basically a demon transformation, which gives you a lot of different attacks and such. But again, in order to do this, you need to commit a lot of really evil acts, and if you don't want to do that with this character, 
then the Slayer Fawn is out of your reach. So I've so luckily our weapon of choice has actually provided an alternative. That being the giant form. Grow to a fearsome size, your weapons deal an extra 1d6 slashing damage and you gain 27 temporary hit points, in addition to advantage on strength checks and saving throws. Recovers every short rest and lasts for 10 turns. So not only are we getting the most powerful weapon in the game, we're also getting Devil Trigger built in, or something close to it. It's basically just a type of transformation. I mean, I mean, calling it Devil Trigger is a bit of a stretch. Obviously, Slayer is closer thematically. But when you're in Slayer form, you can't use your weapons. And I swear the DCs for that form are super, super low. So it's not really worth using, in my opinion. I find the Slayer form to be really underpowered, actually. you actually I feel like you would be nerfing yourself if you actually use the Slayer form with this build. But using the Giant form, it's just another massive buff. Additional damage, additional hit points, additional checks and saving throws for strength you can't go wrong so i feel like in this case we've at least covered devil trigger lastly covering gunslinger is our dual crossbows first up is the hellfire and crossbow now this is really cool because it's a plus two crossbow I've, as far as i understand it's the only one in the game uh i don't i I've, I've been told you can buy plus two hand crossbows from vendors but i haven't seen anything like that so correct me if i'm wrong but, you know, you can use this with the flourishes. Um, if you're hiding or invisible, so if you're, you know, playing more into a stealth aspect, you actually get to inflict burning. But you also get, and this is just a neat little bonus, you get Scorching Ray. Passed as a level 3, which allows you to do 86 fire damage. Or 3 at ranged. Covering the alternate shot type that you would get with the Gunslinger style in DMC. So, yeah, pretty cool. You get a plus 11 to hit with it and it does decent damage again if you're attacking with this multiple times in a round it's pretty powerful the other crossbow we're going to be using is the near misser which you can get from oh i didn't actually say where you get older and script giant slayer for i'll just say you get it around the same time you get the helm um the hellfire hand crossbow you can get in act two in the underground temple that leads to kind of like the finale of act two uh you get that there from a certain enemy uh, the Near Missa, you get in Act 2 as well. You can buy it from a vendor in Moonrise Towers. This is kind of a similar deal to the Hellfire Hand Crossbow. It's only a plus one, but it has a unique property in that it does entirely force damage, so you can bypass piercing resistance. And you also get ma Magic Missile to cast as a level three once per short rest. So, yeah. Another alternate shot type, and you get Magic Missile for free. Pretty damn cool. So, that is the build. Overall, you get 20 AC with the ability to uh, to bring it up with your skills and spells. You get healing. You get you get stylish greatsword combos. You get stylish ranged combos with your dual crossbows. You get a whole bunch of different buffs. You get different stats. You get to use diff a bunch of different subclasses. You get a ton of dialogue options. You get um. You get decent stats all around. I kind of would like charisma to be a bit higher, but it doesn't really affect too much. Um, but yeah, you also get a ton of really cool proficiencies. At the very worst, you have plus two in everything. At the best, you have plus 12 in Slate of Hand, for example, where you get 11 in your speech stuff. It's really, really, really strong. Uh, yep, you get it. And then you get all these saving for buffs. So yeah, I think that this build in testing, and in my own personal experience, this is one of the strongest builds I've ever made uh, in between D&D &D and this game, because I've played a few playthroughs now. Um, and I find that this build is insanely strong, it's thematic, it's cool, you get to do a whole bunch of different things with it. Um, I think that's going to do it here. I mean... The only, like one of the big downsides you actually get with this build is that you have to organize all of this, but um, you know you can do that easily. But yeah, I think I think that's going to do it for this video. Um, try it out for yourself. Respec one of your characters. Give it a go. See how you feel about it. It, as far as actually playing the game with it is concerned, in which you actually go for level one to twelve in a natural playthrough. You know, playing casually. Um. I mean, you can, I would say that this can work as a first build, but I would definitely just 
play this. I would use this on maybe like a secondary playthrough as kind of like something fun to try out because trying to is getting getting extra attack as late as we do really hurts the melee aspect. You don't get your full power crossbow stuff until pretty much the very end of the build and you don't get a lot of offensive spells so you have to kind of use your utility to the best of its ability. My experience playing through the game was pretty good. I felt underpowered compared to some of my party members kind of around the early to early mid game sort of but as soon as you get past that kind of mid game point and you get into like act three and you get all your items and you get like the final levels you need to really make this build powerful you will be shredding anything that comes towards you and it is just such a fun build to do it's stylish it's thematic it's fun it's funny you know with vicious mockery and such which at this point is 3d4 like and you just get to do so many cool different things. Teleporting around the map, you're shooting, you're slashing, you're transforming, you're casting spells, you're jumping around and teleporting. It's just, oh, it's so fun. Give this build a try. You won't regret it. And yeah.